So, um, first of all, I would like to express how glad I am to be here. I really wanted to attend the first convention back in uh, April of 2012, but due to time constraints and other pressing responsibilities, I wasn't able to join that historic occasion. This gathering is somehow comforting. There is a feeling of oneness with like-minded individuals. Though there may be differing views on certain issues and subjects, one can feel a general sense of community here. I guess some of you are curious as to why I got invited here to talk. Frankly, I too am not exactly sure why. I guess uh, one reason is because I am an atheist, or you can use any other term you're comfortable with, whatever that term denotes, the non-belief in a god, the god, divinity, or the supernatural. Another reason, perhaps, is because of what I do for a living. That is, I teach kids about the wonders of the universe. Uh, through my basic astronomy lectures in the company I work for, Voyager Educational and uh, Event Services. Now, um, if you can pardon me, the following will mostly be autobiographical. And forgive me if, if I have to take you on this side trip down memory lane. Uh, I will try my best to keep it short. But I think it's important that I share a little bit about my background so it can act as a framework for you to see things from my perspective. When I come to the part where I'll share what I currently do for a living. So I, I actually was born here in Metro Manila, Paranaque to be specific, in, the, in September of 1971, a full year before former President Marcos declared martial law in the Philippines. I was the eldest of three kids. Uh, our parents moved around a lot because they were young graduate students trying to finish their masters. I spent a considerable portion of my childhood in uh, Los Baños, Laguna because that's where my folks were doing their graduate uh, schooling, their graduate theses. And I also spent a considerable amount of my childhood in the Mindanao State University, which is in Mindanao, down south, uh, where it's Islamic. Uh, most of the communities there are Islamic. So um, I had the unique opportunity to observe both Christian communities while growing up in Los Baños, and also uh, Muslim or Islamic communities down south in uh, Mindanao. Now, um, as, I've, as far as I can recall, we never went to church when I was a kid. Uh, but I, I wouldn't call my parents atheists per se, but I'm pretty sure they were free thinkers. I also think that they were in fact humanists. After all, they were community development workers. They actually went from, from town to town helping out farmers and fishermen, fisher folk. Um, whenever I uh, think of childhood, this is what I think about, our bookshelves. Uh, my dad collected books, and he built a mini library in a corner of our house, an extensive collection of books, mostly on history, e economics, and philosophy, but also books on science and technology. They encouraged us kids to read and develop our uh, natural abilities and talents. This is one of my favorite books from childhood. It's uh, The Universe and Evolution. It's from the Time Life series of books. So as you can see, from a very early age, um, I felt I knew how things worked. I had this feeling that I've figured things out, mainly because the true nature of the universe was gradually revealed to me via astronomy. This was a time period wherein, as a kid, I was absorbed in all things astronomy. At this age, I was observing sunspots on the sun, using dark film as a crude solar filter. I was observing solar and lunar eclipses when they happened, uh, using my dad's old binoculars. So to me, this was an age of wonder and discovery, and no amount, no amount of religious indoctrination would shake that wonder and yearning to know the unknown about the universe. I'm not sure if you noticed it, but this year's logo for the Patas Convention is actually patterned after an asterism known as the Big Dipper. But it's actually not uh, a constellation, no? it's actually an asterism, a little astronomy lesson there. Uh, it's actually part of Ursa Major, which is the Great Bear. Okay, not much visible here because uh, it's close to the north. I was enrolled in the Mindanao State University Science High School during my teen years. By this time, we were back once again in the Mindanao State University in Marawi City, which is an Islamic city, as I've mentioned before. And the irony here was I was learning about science in the midst of communities who were practicing religion and culture which had edicts and tenets contrary to the scientific method. Well, I wasn't really bothered by that fact much because like um, most geeky kids at that time, I got so absorbed in tech, especially in computers. 
So this preoccupation with computers uh, led me to programming. So I, got, I learned how to do basic in Pascal. And I eventually got hooked on computers. And naturally, when you get hooked on computers, you also like video games. You like uh, computer games. Perhaps this contributed a lot to me fail almost failing my fourth year physics class, which was terribly embarrassing for me, considered I loved astronomy and engineering, and I had a passion for science. The one thing that saved me, well, it was an astronomical event. Uh, there was a uh, solar eclipse back in 1988, which actually uh, was seen in the Mindanao Island. So I submitted a picture of this as a physics uh, a project, and they pa let me pass my, my uh, high school. So in 1988, I uh, passed the University of the Philippines College Entrance Test and spent my first year at uh, UP Diliman majoring in landscape architecture. But the stress of the culture shock coming in from Mindanao, it's, it's kind of different. Uh, it's a totally different world there back in Mindanao. So here in Manila, I, got, I also had chicken pox. Uh, it's, it's really sad if you're a freshman student and you're like all alone having chicken pox. So my parents just told me to get back to Mindanao. After all, there was a university there. So uh, I enrolled there. I, I jumped from course to course. So I was like a, um, a course jumper. Uh, uh, I, was in, I enrolled in computer programming because I had background in uh, programming back in high school. But I eventually settled to being an English major because I couldn't hurdle the maths of uh, computer science. So from a creative course to a technical course and back to a creative course again. Then after graduating from college in 1995, I started out my adult life teaching introductory English literature and the humanities as well as public speaking. After my contract expired, I tried some odd jobs here and there. A layout artist at a local uh, printing press where I acquired desktop publishing skills. A reporter for the Manila Standard newspaper here in Manila where I polished my writing and computer skills. Also a media production specialist uh, in a sister university of the Mindanao State University in Iligan City where I learned to d design websites and do internet, internet stuff. It was also at this period uh, when I taught myself how to uh, do 3D modeling. So uh, I, I did uh, 3D work uh, using 3D Studio Max and uh, Maya. I, I don't know if you're familiar with these programs. So a word of advice to the young people here. It's not that negative if you find yourself jumping from job to job or from career to career because you do pick up knowledge and wisdom that can propel you to becoming better at your next job. So uh, in, in 2007, I left my job in Iligan City and joined a startup in Cebu. Uh, and this startup is called Avatrian LLC, uh, where I worked on developing digital content for virtual worlds. Any, anyone here uh, is familiar with a virtual world known as Second Life or OpenSim? So I am a Second Life user because of, of my job in Cebu. So uh, we worked on pretty cool stuff. We were content creators. We, we, we create your houses in Second Life, or your chairs and your other things, quote unquote. Uh, so I think word got around of our skills because we were contacted by uh, Wheeling Jesuit University based in Wheeling, West Virginia. They were sponsored by NASA. NASA had this program called the Classroom of the Future. So WJU was awarded uh, Classroom of the Future grant and they were searching for a company that can help them realize this vision of a simulation of a classroom field trip to the moon. We, we met with their team with Skype, and after about a week's worth of meetings, we signed a contract to build Moon World, and we were welcomed aboard the projects. It took us around eight months, eight to 12 months to create this world. And we were also given an additional year's contract for its maintenance and upkeep, and a possible Mars World uh, project in the horizon. So Moon World was really a awakening uh, moment for me because it, it, it rekindled my interest in astronomy. Uh, it feels like a multiplayer game, uh, a kind that uh, any kid might want to play, but it was carefully crafted so while playing the game, the kids would learn about lunar geology and basic astronomy. So our company basically designed a game wherein kids from high school computer labs across the U.S. or around the world could log into and participate in a virtual field trip on the moon. Their characters or avatars, as we call uh, the people going around in the computer screen, get to wear spacesuits and walk on the moon, collect rocks and soil samples, uh, drive the lunar rovers to determine uh, certain characteristics of the evolution of the lunar landscape. So you can imagine I was in my element. Uh, my childhood passion for astronomy uh, was really uh, boosted, considering I had to do a ton of research to do Moon World. This is when my 3D skills were put to good use because I, I, was, 
I was the one in charge of making the spacesuits, the, the lunar terrain. So I, I made all of that. And the rocks that you see, uh, the, 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 what the kids pick up as samples. So um, I'm a fan of the Apollo program. So any one of you here who don't believe that people have walked on the moon, you can debate with me afterwards. Because there are some those uh, doubtful about that. It's interesting to note that while Moon World experiment was going, ongoing, an independent team at WJU was tasked to do research on the viability of such teaching tools in enhancing the learning of complex scientific subjects such as lunar field geology. The results of the research shows that this experimental teaching method was indeed effective in bringing the learning concepts closer to the kids, but still needed guidance from mentors to successfully navigate through the excursion. I'll pause here and put things into the context of this conference. So I learned a lot while being involved in the Moon World Project, especially the realization of how powerful science can be in shaping how kids perceive science and the scientific method. If we understand secular humanism to be a movement that has a solid foundation in rationality and the scientific method, I felt that I wanted to be involved in ventures such as this that would focus on that aspect of learning, if only to pave the way for a more secular and a humanistic future. So what I mean is, uh, if we have a barrier to break, I think one method to break this barrier is to attack the problem at its roots by inviting young minds to see the universe as it really is, not how positions of authority dictate it to be. And this is wh why I do, why I do uh, what I do. My involvement, however, with uh, Avatrian LLC and uh, Moon World uh, ended with a rather sad note. In mid-2011, WJU announced to us that they received word from NASA that President Obama decided to reduce NASA's budget, and it's still ongoing. And you know, uh, even uh, they, they're putting the wrong people in, uh, in charge. And one of the victims was educational projects, so WJU's funding ceased, and the CODEF project died. So we basically had to stop working on Moon World. Since Moon World was all we were working on, um, I had to like quit my job because uh, uh, we, we didn't even uh, have a client already. So it was kind of a sad to have uh, such an interesting project ongoing and then NASA would just cut the budget. I went back to the Mindanao State University hoping to get a contract back to teaching English-related subjects again. When I was contacted by astronomer friends to join a newly formed company, in Davao City. This is where I currently live and work, uh, still in Mindanao. So it was a company that brought astronomical uh, equipment such as telescopes and inflatable planetarium domes to schools around Davao City. Uh, the usual uh, arrangement here in Manila is uh, the school would be bringing their kids to like uh, there in the MOA, there's the Explorium, or it, there in Luneta, you have the planetarium, the old one over there. But uh, in our case, we have two buses. Here's me. Uh, a pale imitation of John Claude Van Damme uh, posed in our two buses. We go around Mindanao using our two buses. So um, they told me they needed a lecturer who, aside from having the ability to give an astronomy lecture inside a planetarium, I should also have the ability to train new lecturers in basic astronomy because at that point, they were planning to expand their operations around Mindanao Island. And eventually, Visayas and Luzon were coming over here. So now this news came as a delightful surprise for me, of course. So I ex uh, immediately accepted the offer and joined Voyager in January of 2012. So in the past uh, three years of operating, we have been to over 300. We have been over 300 schools around Mindanao. And we've also served schools in Cebu City just last year. We've been to Visayas. In December of 2013, I was designated as manager. So now there are two teams. Uh, we began another program that focuses more on marine conservation. So this time from, from the sky down to the seas. So now we focus on marine conservation and environmental awareness. So this event group we, we refer to as the Aqua Program and the, the older group, the Astro Program. Now you have, you have to understand that my company, while having this mission of inspiring young minds about science through astronomy and marine biology and ecology, are mainly composed of theists. Even the owner uh, is a member of the Philippine Independent Church. We have our own version of Catholicism here that's not connected with the Vatican. They're called the Aglipayan, after uh, Gregorio Aglipay. Yes. So, um, but uh, they allow me, the company allows me complete freedom over the development of the content of the lectures. 
And I see to it that the content is totally secular and have no religious or spiritual references. I, however, do not deliberately or consciously preach atheism or non-belief, even scientism, because sometimes people who are proponents of science are mistaken to be uh, proponents of scientism, which is also another topic in itself. So deliver delivering these lectures to kids, our message is to the kids are, is actually simple. The universe that they see inside my planetarium dome and the real sky that they view with our telescopes was created around 13.8 billion years ago uh, out of something called the Big Bang. And there's not yet any concrete evidence that the divine being made it. A conclusion brought about by critical thinking, rationalism, empiricism, all of which are hallmarks of secular humanism. While I know that perhaps by doing that doesn't necessarily or instantly automatically turn them into atheists or non-believers, I feel that it does plant the seeds of the eagerness to know and learn more about the universe rather than just to accept what we are taught uh, by religions and beliefs. And to me, that's already enough. It's uh, what you call a foot in the door, so to speak, just to start or get the thing uh, bo uh, ball rolling. It's an invitation to the kids to know more about science and the scientific method. And it's not only kids that serve as our audience, but the teachers of the schools that we visit. Some of these teachers have an antiquated science books, and their knowledge of astronomy is quite limited. We actually hold uh, teachers update training every now and then. We actually teach the teachers how to teach uh, these complex uh, uh, astronomical topics. So to, to somehow upgrade their knowledge on astronomy and the natural sciences. Now, whenever we do these school tours, we give the school administrators an evaluation sheet to allow them to grade or rate our school event. This feedback mechanism allows us to see the faults in our methods and if our presentations had any impact towards the kids' awareness in astronomy or science in general. Now, I know that some of you here who thrive in the culture of research who are keen on exacting methodologies of research are probably uh, raising your eyebrows and want to express the fact that we cannot make definitive uh, conclusions about our methods if in fact they're effective or not. Maybe one day I could invite some of you who are interested to do research if we are actually creating an impact there when we do our thing. So, um, but I, I do believe that if our methods were grossly ineffective, then the teachers and administrators would immediately take note of this, considering that they are professionals in the field of teaching, and that they would recommend to the Department of Education, the DepEd, uh, that we be shut down if we're not, we're not really doing anything effective. So, um, as you know, um, especially the fact that uh, we are actually not uh, non-profit, we do it for profit. Because, as any of you know, any venture such as ours cannot continue operating if we cannot cover our expenses to conduct our activities. So um, at this point, I'm going to show you some of the stuff I show to the kids. Um, this is basically the same software that we use. It's, uh, so this is actually the sky outside right now. I think it's the same time. That, uh, there's Earth Manila. So, but if I move time forwards, I hope it's moving forwards. There, there it is. So now there, so here's the night sky. But you don't actually see this kind of night sky anymore in Manila because in Manila right now, it's light polluted. Uh, so you have to go to somewhere like Antipolo or even further away towards Laguna to really enjoy the night sky. So this is uh, some uh, crude, um, what's this, uh, simulation of what I do inside the Planetary Doom. I show, uh, for, for some of you, this is very common because you can e even download this from your, uh, on your phones. There's something called Google Sky Map uh, that's free that you can download from uh, Google Play. Uh, you can use uh, the GPS of your phone. You point your phone anywhere, and you basically have a planetarium in your pocket, and it helps you learn about the night sky. But that simple tool, just imagine, that simple tool, if you can use that to, to teach somebody astronomy, that's already you know, like waking up their uh, interest in, in science by just doing that. So with this uh, software, I can even show you uh, where we got the inspiration for the PATAS uh, logo. So these are, the, these are the constellations and their names. So there it is. That's the Big Dipper, or some major. So you see it over there. So by letting the kids get familiar with the night sky, it's, it's, it, it, I, I, I will have a hard time describing to you the, the feeling 
of actually uh, doing that. I mean, showing uh, uh, the, the wonders of the universe to the kids. It's something personal that you really have to experience yourself. So that's why I invite you, if you have time, to like download that Google thing, the, uh, the sky map, and show to little kids about, look, right now, it, uh, this July, those two bright objects that you see, those are not stars. That's actually the planet Jupiter and the planet Venus. And they're going to conjunct, meaning they're going to be one by July 1 towards the western sky. And it's going to be a very bright object in the sky. So that alone will, will start their minds getting curious about things. So little, little bits of uh, effort in trying to convince kids about science, it's already enough. It's already uh, a good uh, step in the right direction. So let me get back to my presentation and uh, just skip over some stuff. So in conclusion, um, the most compelling uh, remark I received uh, from a teacher in a school was um, she felt our presentations made her want to be a child again. Isn't that <laughs> something uh, very meaningful? The, if, if a person wants to be a child again, it means that you want to bring back the innocence and the wonder. So she wanted to rediscover the wonder and excitement of knowing the unknown, which is presently in the natural curiosity of children. Then as we grow up, uh, it gets slowly eroded <laughs> by religious dogma and other norms and practices that we exercise as, as adults, to be adults. Uh, as to the most compelling remark I've received from a child who experienced my planetarium lecture, it would have to be from this scrawny looking girl wearing a dirty outfit because you know in some of the schools we go to, they don't even have school uniforms. They just wear their, their clothes from the farm. Um, uh, who among you here know uh, uh, the Cebuano language? You, you would understand uh, these words. Daku adi ay sa atong universe, karon palang ko nakabalo. Translated to, wow, the universe is way bigger than I expected. I, I didn't realize that until now. I mean, Medio melodramatic, but uh, you know, you get teary-eyed moments when you, when when a kid says that to you because you just opened her eyes to something like that. So I feel as if I've broken through a barrier. Uh, is the video even playing? <laughs> so I feel as if I've broken through a barrier of misunderstanding and myth about the nature of the universe, and it inspires me to continue on this path of promoting science awareness through my company, through Voyager, in the hopes of building a more secular and humanistic future. The story of mine is, uh, and my quest isn't over for me yet. In fact, it has just actually begun. We're quite young. We just started in 2012. So with this, uh, I hope that uh, my message to you would be to inspire you uh, to do effort in your capacity to get kids interested in science. And I think that's the, the key, one of the key points in opening the eyes of people to rationality, empiricism, critical thinking, all hallmarks of secular humanism. Thank you for your time. So uh, my first question, coming from me, okay. Um, I know that you usually present this to students, okay? Uh, to students, regardless whether they're from non sectarian or sectarian schools, right? Right. Okay, so how would you present this, uh, the topics that you mentioned earlier, to students in sectarian schools who generally strive hard to embed religion in every, and I mean every, subject? Surprisingly, and uh, I, 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 re uh, I really observed this, but surprisingly, when we go to like Catholic schools, we've been to a lot of Catholic schools and even uh, uh, these uh, Protestant schools. I don't know why. I, maybe we've been lucky, but in my observation is they actually do a hands-off. Believe it or not, they actually have a hands-off policy. I think it's in the approach. Just like uh, what Bill said earlier, it's in the manner of approaching them because we have... We have uh, marketing uh, agents that we train to approach a school in a manner, especially a sectarian school, in such a manner that wouldn't, wouldn't make the program feel um, hostile to, to whatever um, beliefs or uh, 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 religion that they, they support. So um, it's in the approach. So if we approach the school uh, in, in a very friendly way, we, we get them, we get them aboard. And uh, even the, it's funny, uh, I even have pictures wherein I'm posed with nuns, with Catholic nuns, and uh, beside us is like uh, our poster of the Big Bang Theory. 
But then I would even talk to the nuns, and they, they don't even know th this fact that, did you know that uh, uh, the Big Bang Theory was formulated by a, a priest, uh, Lematre, uh, George Lematre, uh, he uh, uh, formulated the idea of the Big Bang Theory. So they would be surprised and shocked, and in fact, it somehow makes the whole thing friendlier. The atmosphere con for conversation becomes more friendly instead of being hostile. We find links that would, I know you might be frowning to, to think that it's connecting faith and, and rationalism because the two are polar opposites, but what I'm trying to say is we just find a common level ground or something that allows us to talk. As, this is all about conversation, right? So if we have the venue for conversation, we're getting there. It's not something like, we're a science program and we're going to eliminate all your religious blah, blah, blah. Like, we're not, we're, we're, we don't do that. Here's another question. Uh, there are lots of scientists uh, here in this country that remain, that, choose, uh, that chose to remain religious despite their education, despite their expertise in uh, the fields of science. What is your opinion on this? It does not only apply to... Uh, uh, scientific, uh, people in the science community in the Philippines, but of course internationally. Um, especially in the Philippines, I think the reason behind it is the fact that uh, there is a kind of social responsibility for some of these people. If you have picked up a copy of the Panorama today, of the, uh, the, uh, the Manila, Manila, uh, or for, from the Manila Bulletin, the, the issue of Panorama has two of our astrophysicists on the cover. You may know hers, Reina, Reina Bel Reyes, and uh, Rogel Marie Sese. They're not very vocal, I, I guess, except for Reina. I think Reina has attended some patas related events. But uh, Rogel is more m moderate about it. But when we talk, I mean, uh, he's my friend, uh, Mr. Rogel Sese, who is an astro astrophysicist, a Filipino astrophysicist. I mean, uh, I, I guess most of them are closet atheists. That's what I can say. They're, not just, they're just not opening up because they have social responsibilities. Some of these people have positions in government or positions in their companies. So they're not, they're not just like most of you. Most of you I know in Facebook, but I don't know your real names because you're hiding. You know, it's, it's the same thing with them. They're trying to protect something, but it's, it's sad because they cannot come out in the open and really be vocal about their advocacy for science. It should start happening. I mean, that's what I do. Do you have any anecdotes about fundamentalists protesting on what you do? Fundamentalists who protest what I do. Well, there was this one instance that, that we really uh, met face to face with a fundy. Uh, it was during, there was a recent lunar eclipse. It wasn't visible here in Manila because it was cloudy, but it was really nice there back down in Davao because we did, uh, our weather was good. But we, we held it in a public plaza. And there were people there. There were like people who, I think, there are similar people in Luneta who go around and, you know, like preach about doomsday, doomsday <laughs> fanaticists. And we had like an almost head-to-head headbutt uh, head encounter with these people. But again, moderation saved the day. You just, you just have to be friendly towards these people and they actually li uh, listen to you and listen to reason. It's all about the approach. I don't know, maybe, maybe I'm, I, I don't know if I'm soft, a soft-spoken person, but I try to talk reason with them. I don't, I don't really argue with them in, a, in an antagonizing manner. Yeah. 